Today on Brief History, we discuss one of the most detested English kings remembered throughout the centuries. The way in which he would seize power and the alleged actions that followed his ascension would lead to hatred and disdain through the modern day. But is this hatred well founded or was his story simply an example of his enemies writing his history? Join me as I take a brief look at Richard Duke of Gloucester, remembered today as Richard III of England. Richard was born on October 2, 1452, at Fotheringhay Castle in Northamptonshire. He was the son of Richard, Duke of York, and his mother was Cecily Neville. He was the 11th of 12 children between his parents, but would end up being the youngest surviving son and child of seven surviving children. Three of his brothers would survive to adulthood, Edward, who would become King Edward IV of England, Edmund, who would become the Earl of Rutland, and George, who would become Duke of Clarence. It was said that Richard's mother's pregnancy with him was a difficult one, and this is probably true, but there have been many more rumors about Richard's birth that were formulated much later, after events we will shortly discuss took place. It was said that Richard's birth was an unnatural one, that he remained in his mother's womb for significantly longer than what was to be expected, and that he was born with teeth and long hair. Although the difficulty of the pregnancy is believable, much of the other claims surrounding his so-called unnatural birth are widely disbelieved. Being that Richard was one of the younger children in his family, very little is known about his early youth. Presumably, he was brought up similarly to other aristocratic children of that time, having the necessary values instilled in him from a young age, learning to read and ride, and was influenced by the church and its teachings. Richard initially lived in his mother's household, and by the time that Richard was born, it is most likely true that only six of her twelve children were living at the time. Around the time of Richard's birth, or shortly thereafter, Richard's two eldest brothers, Edward and Edmund, moved to Ludlow, and it is believed that he did not know them well in his youth. Richard, being the fourth surviving son, was not scheduled to inherit much, if anything, and thus, as was the case with many younger sons in that time, his life was centered initially around education and learning, although events would take place during his adolescence, which would change this. Richard grew up in a chaotic time, when events known today as the Wars of the Roses were taking place. Richard was to play a major role in the Wars of the Roses, and would infamously be remembered for his part in the conflicts. But before we discuss his role, we must understand some background to the Wars of the Roses, and how Richard came to be in the position he was in. To start, the Wars of the Roses was fought between the House of Lancaster with their Red Rose Heraldic Badge and Richard's House of York, whose Heraldic Badge was the White Rose, hence the name Wars of the Roses. The foundations of the conflict actually go all the way back to Richard's great-great-grandfather, King Edward III's reign. Edward had four sons that require mentioning. Edward of Woodstock, known today as the Black Prince, Lionel of Antwerp, Duke of Clarence, John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, and Edmund of Langley, Duke of York. Edward of Woodstock should have inherited the throne from Edward III, but died before Edward III did. Therefore, the throne passed to the Black Prince's son, Richard, who became King Richard II upon Edward III's death. Richard was unpopular and tyrannical, and his throne was usurped by his first cousin, Henry of Lancaster, also known as Henry Bolingbroke, who would become King Henry IV of England. Henry IV was the first Lancastrian king. He was the father to King Henry V and grandfather to King Henry VI, Henry VI being the king at the time of Richard's birth. The Lancastrian king's claims were all derived through Edward III's third surviving son, John of Gaunt. However, during Henry IV's usurpation and time as king and Henry V's subsequent reign, the lineage of John of Gaunt's elder brother, Lionel of Antwerp, Duke of Clarence, were still alive and technically had a better claim to the throne. These claimants to the throne were known as the Mortimers, 
Henry IV and Henry V were very powerful kings, and the Mortimers at the time of the Lancastrian usurpation and subsequent reigns were young and had little support, and thus never pushed their claim to the throne. However, the Lancastrian king at the time of Richard's birth, Henry VI, was a weak and unpopular one, and thus the descendants of Lionel of Antwerp, Duke of Clarence, would finally push their claim to the throne. The descendant of Lionel of Antwerp, Duke of Clarence, that would have had a claim to the throne at the time of Henry VI's ascension, was a man named Edmund Mortimer, Earl of March, but he died early in Henry VI's reign without children. Therefore, his claim passed to his nephew, son of his sister Anne Mortimer. This was Richard's father, Richard, Duke of York. Anne Mortimer had married a man named Richard of Conisborough from the House of York, thus merging the lineages of Lionel of Antwerp, Duke of Clarence, with the lineage of Edmund of Langley, Duke of York, Edward III's fourth surviving son. Richard's father would push his claim to the throne after the disastrous end of the Hundred Years' War, which saw England completely defeated by the French, with all of their possessions on the continent being seized, with the exception of Calais. Henry VI was also very inept as a ruler, as he played favorites, was incapable of or unwilling to make proper decisions, and on top of everything, had a debilitating mental illness. The First Battle of the Wars of the Roses, known as the First Battle of St. Albans, took place when Richard was around three years old in 1455. It saw Richard's father and one of his allies, Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, who will be discussed in more detail later in Richard's story, take control of Henry VI and temporarily defeat their Lancastrian opponents. However, power would shift back and forth during the Wars of the Roses, and eventually Richard's father and his second eldest brother, Edmund, Earl of Rutland, were killed at the Battle of Wakefield in 1460 when Richard was around eight years old. As devastating a blow as this was, the Yorkist cause did not die with Richard's father. Instead, Richard's eldest brother, Edward, took on the leading role as the Yorkist claimant to the throne of England. Edward would go on to win great victories in battle, most notably the decisive Battle of Towton, which would see massive Lancastrian losses. Henry VI would be forced to flee into exile in Scotland, but would eventually be captured and imprisoned at the Tower of London. Richard's brother, Edward, would be crowned as Edward IV of England, and this, mixed with the death of Richard's other elder brother, Edmund, Earl of Rutland, would lead to significant future changes in young Richard's life. The death of Richard's father and his elder brother Edmund made Richard and his other surviving elder brother George significantly more important politically as they became next in line to the Yorkist cause due to the fact that their elder brother Edward at that point had no children. In 1461, Richard's mother had actually sent him and his brother George, 8 and 11 years old respectively at the time, to the continent for safety where they were received by the Prince Bishop. David of Burgundy, and remained abroad until their brother had won the victories discussed previously. Richard's brother Edward's ascension as King of England drastically changed Richard's life, and both he and his brother George would be seen as useful tools for Edward. Both were knighted ahead of Edward's coronation in June 1461, and both would become Knights of the Garter. They would also become Dukes. George first would become Duke of Clarence, and then Richard himself would be made Duke of Gloucester in November 1461 at just nine years of age. Additionally, both would be made Premier Dukes, giving them precedence over existing Dukes, making them the first two English Dukes to be elevated to such titles without already being Earls. Richard was appointed as Admiral of England just after he turned 10 in October 1462, although he was not exercising any power. Richard's brother George was said to have received preferential treatment over Richard, as George was the heir apparent due to him being older. Nevertheless, both were being groomed to be useful tools for their elder brother, King Edward. They were still very young and still had much to learn, and therefore, Edward had Richard, George, and their sister Margaret moved from their mother's household into their own establishment at the new Palace of Greenwich near London. There, they continued to be educated with unnamed young boys, their age, to keep them company. Around 1463, Richard was moved to the household of Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, briefly touched on previously. 
Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, had been an ally to Richard's father prior to his death and then had subsequently aided Richard's elder brother Edward in defeating the Lancastrians, thus opening Edward's path to kingship. Due to this, along with events we will discuss shortly, Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, would develop the nickname to which he is remembered today, the Kingmaker. There is little information on Richard's time in Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick's household, but it is not believed that he traveled with Warwick everywhere that he went, nor did he become politically loyal to Warwick, as we will soon see. Richard would have interacted with his future wife, Anne Neville, daughter of Warwick, but due to their youth, 13 years old and 9 years old at the time, it is unlikely that a connection was made between the two. This time in Warwick's household may have acquainted him with northern interests and may have assisted him in his future endeavors in the north, something that we will discuss later in Richard's story. Richard surely observed a great household in action in Warwick's care, and most likely learned much from his time there. It is believed that it was here that he began to acquire many skills that would benefit him in the future, including learning to ride and fight, to which he would become exceptional at, despite his slight build and potential physical limitations due to scoliosis. His understanding in the logistics of war would have been greatly affected in Warwick's household as well, something that would also serve him well in the future. By 1468, when Richard turned 16, he had completed his formal training and was ready to enter the main stage of politics. Richard's brother, King Edward IV, and Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, began to distance themselves from one another, despite previously being strong allies against the Lancastrians. Edward had alienated Warwick with his private marriage to Elizabeth Woodville, during which time Warwick was negotiating marriages, and his insistence on an alliance with Burgundy over the Warwick-favored French. Additionally, Edward angered Richard's other brother, George Duke of Clarence, by refusing to allow him to marry Warwick's daughter, Isabel. This cooling of relations between Edward and Warwick would eventually erupt into violence after Warwick and George Duke of Clarence secretly performed the vetoed marriage in Calais before declaring their opposition to Edward and marching against him, although it was presented as opposition to Edward's favorites, i.e. the Queen's family, known as the Woodvilles. Richard, despite being part of Warwick's household, played no part in Warwick and his brother, George Duke of Clarence's plan to oppose Edward. In fact, Richard backed Edward, but he was too young and inexperienced at the time to make a significant difference and was not recorded at the Battle of Edgecote, where Edward's supporters, including the Queen's father Richard Woodville, were defeated and executed, nor was Richard with Edward when he was subsequently captured by Warwick and George Duke of Clarence. Nevertheless, Warwick and George, Duke of Clarence, would be unable to maintain control of the kingdom, and they were eventually forced to release Edward, who would begin to reestablish himself as king. With this, Richard's stock began to rise immensely, with responsibilities and titles being bestowed to him, including being made the Constable of England. A fragile truce was made between Edward, Warwick, and George, Duke of Clarence, but soon it was apparent that Warwick and George were again up to no good. Edward moved against them, and they were forced to flee to the continent, where they were received by Louis XI of France. Louis XI brokered a reconciliation between Warwick and Henry VI's wife and son, Queen Margaret of Anjou and Prince Edward of Westminster, who were living in exile on the continent at the time. Warwick married his daughter Anne, Richard's future wife, briefly touched on previously, to Prince Edward of Westminster and agreed to aid him and Queen Margaret against Richard's brother, King Edward. Therefore, Warwick and George Duke of Clarence had essentially taken on the Lancastrian cause, astounding in that Warwick had played such a major role in the Lancastrian defeats in the years prior. George Duke of Clarence stood to gain little from a Lancastrian resurgence, but remained as Warwick's ally for the time being. Richard benefited greatly from Warwick and his brother George's departure and was given responsibilities in the north in place of Warwick, who had previously been one of the key figures in that region. But after the reconciliation of Warwick to Queen Margaret and Prince Edward of Westminster, major events would take place and another bloody phase of the Wars of the Roses would commence. Warwick and George Duke of Clarence would land in England and with the assistance of other uprisings and Warwick's brother, they were able to force Edward to flee into exile himself. King Henry VI, 
still imprisoned at the Tower of London, was released and resumed his kingship in an incredible turn of events. Richard played a minimal, if no, part in these events, and it is believed that he stayed in England longer than his brother Edward did, but eventually he too traveled to the continent to begin his second exile with his brother. The group of exiles were not particularly welcome in Burgundy, despite the fact that the Duke of Burgundy, Charles the Bold, was Richard and Edward's brother-in-law. Charles the Bold had ties to the Lancastrians and did not want war with France. However, soon Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, and Louis XI of France attacked him, which gave him reason to support Richard, Edward, and the other exiles. After five months on the continent, the group sailed back to England in 1471, intent on taking back the throne. George, Duke of Clarence, betrayed his former ally Warwick and joined forces with his brothers upon their return, and they together marched to London, where they recaptured Henry VI, who was placed back into the Tower of London. Warwick moved on London, and the two forces met north of the city at Barnet. The following day, Easter Sunday, the Battle of Barnet took place in a heavy fog, with Richard participating in this his first battle. He would be injured, but fought bravely and proved himself on the field of battle. Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, the Kingmaker, was killed in the fighting, and thus the Yorkists were able to declare victory at Barnet. Unfortunately, they could not rest for long, for on the same day that Warwick was defeated, Henry VI's wife and son, Margaret of Anjou, and Prince Edward of Westminster landed at Weymouth with the Lancastrian force. Richard, his brothers, and the rest of the Yorkist forces immediately set out to confront the Lancastrians and caught up to them at the town of Tewkesbury. At this battle, known as the Battle of Tewkesbury, Richard would command the vanguard, some say as a reward for his bravery and distinguished fighting at Barnet. Again, Richard would prove himself a formidable warrior in battle, with the Yorkists again defeating the Lancastrian forces. Queen Margaret was captured, and Prince Edward of Westminster was killed, some say by Richard himself, although this has been greatly doubted. We will see a common theme in that Richard is often blamed for killing many well-known and important people, although this many times was attributed to him retrospectively. In addition to being accused of killing Prince Edward of Westminster, it has also been alleged that upon the return to London, Richard was also responsible for killing King Henry VI in the Tower of London on his brother Edward's orders. This too obviously has been doubted. Richard had remained loyal to his brother Edward and had proven himself as a brave, capable, and competent warrior. It was now time to reap the rewards for his loyal service. Richard's successful war accomplishments in his brother's service brought him prestige and honor, and many had recognized his accomplishments, including Richard himself, 18 years old at the time of the Battle of Tewkesbury. Richard was learning and growing as a leader, and the events that took place both politically and militarily taught him much about the realities of life in that time. These experiences would shape him into the man he would ultimately become. Many point to Richard's elder brother, George Duke of Clarence, as the feverishly ambitious brother of the lot, due to his aspirations to the throne and conniving behavior against their elder brother. But what many do not realize is that Richard would become almost as ambitious in his life as his elder brother, George, but was much smarter about how he approached his ambitions. An early example of Richard's ambitious personality relates to the marriage of Anne Neville, daughter of the Earl of Warwick, killed at Barnet, and the widow of the killed Prince Edward of Westminster. Richard's brother George Duke of Clarence was married to Anne's sister Isabel, and therefore wished for Anne to remain unmarried so that he could collect the full Warwick inheritance. Richard, not to be deterred by his brother's objections, married Anne Neville anyways, and secured the splitting of Warwick's inheritance, bringing he and his brother George at great odds with each other. Additional examples of Richard's ambitious nature are evident in his dealings with Scotland in the north and his acquisition of lands as he progressed as a leader. Richard was initially made warden of the Scottish West March, but after Edward and his allies had eliminated the majority of northern Lancastrians in 1464, he had made a truce with Scotland that would last through 1479. 
Therefore, the first 10 years for Richard as warden of the Scottish West March was technically during years of peace with the Scots. Edward expected Richard to be actively maintaining peace per his requests, but he found that diplomacy was not Richard's strong point and that Richard's aggressive nature led to problems. Edward was forced to send others to apologize for certain actions, and he would often be disappointed by Richard's ability to grasp the bigger picture. Richard did not agree with Edward's policy of peace towards Scotland, but he was careful, unlike his brother George, not to upset Edward or raise too much opposition. He would simply defer his desires and hope to take advantage of these opportunities at a later time, when situations changed and were more beneficial to him. This would also be a tactic he would use when acquiring lands and positions as well. Peace was necessary with Scotland at the time because Edward had more pressing issues, specifically his desire to invade France. Edward held animosity toward the French king Louis XI for his role in assisting Warwick and the Lancastrians' endeavor to dethrone him. Therefore, Edward was set on landing on the continent. He was able to raise money to confront the French, and troops were raised with Richard and his brother George, Duke of Clarence, being involved in this process. The English would send a force to France, but battle was not done. Instead, after Edward's allies failed to support him, he concluded the Treaty of Pekingy with the French in 1475, which saw Edward collecting a pension among other things. Richard was also unhappy with this peace, as it seems that by that time he had become eager to fight. But the Treaty of Pekingy would end up falling through due to unforeseen circumstances on the continent, and these circumstances would also be the catalyst to the final dispute between Richard's elder brothers. It seemed that although George Duke of Clarence had recognized his mistake in rebelling with Warwick and had been accepted back into Edward's grace, the two remained suspicious of each other and perhaps a true reconciliation was never fully reached. George Duke of Clarence began to lose face with Edward and his queen Elizabeth Woodville and as George slowly had power pulled from his grip, he foolishly stood up to Edward and paid the ultimate price. George would be executed by Edward, and it is believed that Queen Elizabeth Woodville played a major role in George's downfall. Richard perhaps could have saved his brother had he stood up for him, but he did not, as Richard stood to gain greatly from George's downfall. Richard backed Edward in the matter, but it has been argued, however, that Richard was very unhappy with the circumstances surrounding George's demise and swore to exact revenge on those he saw responsible, which in his mind was the Queen and her family, the Woodvilles. Richard's alleged revenge against the Queen and the Woodvilles is something that will be discussed later in Richard's story. Richard would, throughout the 1470s, accrue many lands and offices throughout the kingdom, which began to increase his power dramatically, and although Edward was certainly in control and would eventually limit Richard to a degree, he allowed his brother significant freedoms in regards to growing his power base. This was especially true in the north. Richard's wardenship of the Scottish West March was inferior to the other marcher wardenships, and this was, of course, not to Richard's liking. Richard began to exploit his elder brother's favor, and by 1480, through relentless pursuits and ambitious actions, he was eventually designated as Lieutenant of the North by Edward, giving him royal authority over all the marches. He had become almost a monarch in his own right, who had his own court, devoted his time to business, and devised ordinances and statutes. He held lands in 25 counties in England and Wales, and was the leading landholder in certain counties, including Yorkshire. Richard had built a large power base in the north, but allowing this was not initially Edward's intention. However, it nevertheless became a reality, and Edward actually benefited from this, in that this brought a greater unity and stability in the north, a place that had historically been known to cause problems for many southern kings. By 1480, Edward's attention had switched to Scotland, as this offered an opportunity to enhance his reputation. The town of Berwick had been lost in the 1460s to the Scots, and Edward desired to recover it, although he had previously lacked the resources to do such a thing. However, Edward would not campaign against Scotland. Instead, Richard would take center stage in the upcoming war with the Scots. This relationship with Scotland suited Richard's personality much better, and he would now be able to prove himself in war, so he thought.
But the reality is that Scotland at the time was not a formidable opponent, being largely leaderless and bankrupt, but that did not mean that Richard could not serve with distinction. This conflict is poorly documented, but it is believed that many times it was expected that Edward would campaign himself throughout the conflict, but this would never become a reality. Richard was actually able to retake the town of Berwick, but not the castle immediately. He continued on to Edinburgh and occupied the town for some time, but became dangerously overstretched with his long lines of supply and communication being at risk. Richard would fall back from Edinburgh. However, throughout negotiation, Richard refused any agreement that would see the Scots retaining Berwick, and eventually the Scots conceded the town with the castle surrendering shortly thereafter. The capture of Berwick, which had been in Scottish hands for 20 years, was a great triumph for Richard, and his brother Edward greatly publicized the matter to the public, which increased Richard's reputation as a military commander. This was the pinnacle of Richard's career, and should he have continued his career in the north, he would surely be remembered differently than he is today. But in April 1483, Richard's brother, King Edward IV, died at 40 years of age, and with that, a new terrible phase of the English monarchy would commence. It is true that Richard had become a great leader in his own right in the north, and that favor extended to him by his brother made him one of the most powerful men in the kingdom. But Richard was not the only person greatly favored by his brother. King Edward also showed great favor towards his queen, Elizabeth Woodville, and her family. Elizabeth Woodville was of significantly lower rank than what would have been expected for a medieval queen, and Edward's marriage to her was actually quite scandalous, having been done in private without the knowledge of many important individuals who should have been in the know. Unsurprisingly, this, mixed with the favor that Edward would show her and her family, caused many to begin to distrust and dislike the Woodvilles, who became a faction in their own right. Although Richard seemed publicly to have had a good relationship with the Queen and her family, it is believed that Richard may have harbored some animosity towards the Woodvilles, perhaps at least in part due to the role that the Queen played in Richard's brother, George Duke of Clarence's demise, discussed previously. Richard had begun to withdraw from court toward the end of Edward's life and spent much of his time in the north. The failure of King Edward to guarantee a continued amicable relationship between Richard and the Woodvilles would lead to an astonishing sequence of events. During Richard and his brother King Edward's exile on the continent, Edward's wife, Queen Elizabeth, had given birth to a son in sanctuary at Westminster Abbey. This boy would become heir to Edward's throne. He was also named Edward, and upon his father's death in 1483, the young Edward, 12 years old at the time, became King Edward V of England. Young Edward had not yet reached his majority, and therefore, some form of minority government needed to be established in the interim until he was able to come of age. Based on precedent, Richard could expect to become protector and exercise a degree of royal power in the name of young Edward. In fact, this was what his brother King Edward had desired prior to his death. However, the Woodvilles did not wish to see this, and instead wished the government to be controlled by a council, to which Richard would be a part of, but the council itself would be dominated by Woodvilles and their supporters. Thus, upon her husband's death, Queen Elizabeth Woodville sent for young Edward to come to England immediately to be crowned as soon as possible, as the role of protector would lapse once a coronation took place. Young Edward set out from where he was stationed at Ludlow in the west with his royal entourage. Richard received news of the Woodville's intentions and of course knew what the Woodville's were attempting and so giving no signs that he was necessarily opposed to anything the Woodville's were doing, requested to meet young Edward and his entourage on the way to London. The meeting point was set at Northampton, and it was said that Richard wished to meet up in order that Edward's entrance to London would be a much more grand occasion. But in reality, Richard had other plans for young Edward. Upon meeting in Northampton, he found that young Edward had traveled on to Stony Stratford, a short distance from Northampton. Richard rushed to Stony Stratford, secured young Edward, and dismissed or arrested the rest of his royal entourage. 
He was aided in this by his cousin, Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, someone who will come up again shortly. Richard traveled to London with young Edward, where Richard was designated as protector. The queen, upon realizing that she and her family would not be able to take control, fled back into sanctuary with her remaining children, including her other son, Richard of Shrewsbury, Duke of York, and her eldest daughter, Elizabeth of York. The queen would end up releasing her younger son, Richard of Shrewsbury, however, after she was pressured by Richard and his supporters. Both young Edward and his brother, Richard of Shrewsbury, would be lodged in the Tower of London and would become infamously known as the Princes in the Tower, something we will touch on shortly. By June, a coup took place. Up to that point, Richard had publicly shown that he was dedicated to supporting young Edward in his role as king and continued to plan for the young boy's coronation. But it quickly became apparent that Richard was seeking more than just a protectorate. His ambitious and aggressive personality led him to shift his focus from being the major power in the north to being the major power over all of England. After initially attempting to declare his now deceased elder brother, King Edward, as illegitimate, a new set of accusations emerged, allegedly relayed by a man named Robert Stillington, Bishop of Bath and Wells. The bishop allegedly claimed that Richard's brother, King Edward IV, had been pre-contracted to marry another woman prior to marrying Queen Elizabeth Woodville, and that the marriage in itself was bigamy, thus young Edward could not be crowned as king because he was illegitimate. An assembly was formed to decide the issue, and this assembly came to the conclusion that young Edward was indeed illegitimate and that he could not be crowned as king, to which they then proceeded to formally offer the throne to Richard. Richard, allegedly showing reluctance, accepted the role. Shortly thereafter, on July 6, 1483, only 10 days after his ascension, in a grand and glamorous occasion, Richard would be crowned as King Richard III of England, alongside his wife, Anne. Richard had been successful in his attempts to usurp the throne, but as we will soon see, maintaining power would prove to be much more difficult than attaining it. After Richard's ascension, he could no longer rely on the element of surprise to assist in his actions. His popularity was low, and he knew that he must make himself more appealing to those who were perhaps less enthusiastic about him seizing power. This included taking over his elder brother, Edward's Yorkist supporters. There was to be no resumption of royal grants upon his ascension. Many of those who served Edward remained in their positions, and Richard went as far as eliminating benevolences, which essentially were expected donations to the king. In essence, Richard took over his brother's household and merely added his own subjects here and there in an effort to appeal to his new subjects. He continually attempted to persuade his new subjects of his legitimacy and promised to be a better ruler than his elder brother. The assembly that saw to Richard becoming king and setting aside his nephew was unofficial, and therefore young Edward had not yet legally been disinherited. Thus, a parliament was set for November 1483, to which it was believed that in this parliament, this issue would be officially taken care of. Richard set out on a tour of the realm, accompanied by his cousin Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, who had been with him at Northampton when young Edward was seized. Buckingham had been a loyal and important supporter of Richard, and thus Richard had by that time rewarded him handsomely for his service with lands and titles. Richard and his queen Anne had also by that time produced their only child and son together, Prince Edward of Middleham, and in September 1483, young Edward of Middleham would be made Prince of Wales and yet another grand occasion that some described as a second coronation. It is interesting to pause here and point out an interesting fact that is not discussed often. Richard was able to attain power and illegally depose his nephew by claiming that his elder brother had been involved in an invalid marriage, which was used as the basis for his usurpation. Incredibly, Richard's marriage to Anne Neville was within the prohibited degrees and was never legalized. Although dispensations had been attained in regards to the marriage in different degrees, one is not known to have been secured in the second degree to cover their relations as brother and sister-in-law twice over. It is believed that Richard was aware of this, but was concerned that this may not have been able to have been granted in any way, even by the Pope, 
and requesting this dispensation would shed light on the issue, most likely ending in a determination that the marriage was invalid, thus putting his Warwick inheritance at risk. Therefore, he took a chance that no one would notice, and incredibly, no one did. There exists a degree of irony in that Richard usurped the throne based on his nephew's illegitimacy due to a prohibited marriage, yet he himself installed his son as Prince of Wales and designated him as his heir, knowing full well that his marriage was never fully validated. Nevertheless, by October 1483, significant events began to unfold. On Richard's tour, word allegedly reached Richard that an attempt to free his nephews, the bastardized Edward V and Richard of Shrewsbury, had taken place at the Tower of London. It has been argued that Richard believed that his kingship would not be safe if the boys lived, and therefore decided to have them killed. The boys would simply disappear and were never seen again. It is believed that many in that time believed that Richard had his nephews killed once the rumors began to spread throughout the kingdom that they were no longer around, and this greatly damaged Richard's reputation. Despite this, Richard made no attempt to produce the boys or refer to their existence, despite the damage his reputation was incurring. It should be noted that, in recent years, the idea that Richard had his nephews killed has been greatly contested by modern supporters of Richard, but this is something that will be discussed further at the end of Richard's story. Around this same time, Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, departed Richard. Little did Richard know that Buckingham had decided that he, for whatever reason, no longer wished to support Richard as king, despite all the benefits and rewards he was reaping. After departing Richard, Buckingham came into contact with a woman named Margaret Beaufort. Margaret Beaufort was the great-granddaughter of John of Gaunt discussed previously, the father of the first Lancastrian king, Henry IV. She descended through John of Gaunt's line of illegitimate children, known as the Beauforts, who had been legitimized during a previous reign. She had been married to the executed King Henry VI's half-brother, a man named Edmund Tudor, Earl of Richmond. This couple had a son before Edmund died of the plague. When Richard's elder brother Edward had seized power for a second time, this young son of Margaret Beaufort had fled into exile on the continent in Brittany, as he did have a Lancastrian claim to the throne, albeit a weak one. This young boy's name was Henry Tudor, and although his claim to the throne was a weak one, his life would be infamously intertwined with Richard's. It is also important to note that by the time that Buckingham had contacted Margaret Beaufort, she had already remarried to a man named Thomas Stanley, who was a previous supporter of Richard's brother Edward, but had been one of the men Richard chose to keep in his service in order to appease Edward's Yorkist household and supporters, as discussed previously. Thomas Stanley will come up again shortly. By the time Richard had seized power in 1483, Henry Tudor was in his 20s, but was relatively unknown. Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, after word of the princes in the tower's demise, may have desired to make a push for the throne himself, but after conspiring with Margaret Beaufort, he ultimately decided that he would support the claim of Henry Tudor. The alleged murder of the princes in the tower by Richard would give Henry Tudor significantly more support than he could have hoped for, should they have remained alive. It is not known precisely when Henry Tudor became the frontrunner of opposition to Richard, but he nevertheless continually gathered support and would eventually be considered the main alternative to the unpopular Richard. Richard received word of Buckingham's betrayal, which infuriated him as would be expected. The Parliament for November was cancelled in order that the rebellion could be dealt with, and although Buckingham's betrayal takes center stage today, being that all the rebellion that took place around this time is often grouped together and all considered part of what is known today as Buckingham's rebellion, it should be noted that there were separate cells of opposition across southern England, all that initially may have had different intentions to start, including restoring the young Edward V. The Woodvilles, including the former Queen Elizabeth, most likely played a role in this as well. Richard had up to that point been able to strong arm his opposition, and most of this opposition had bowed under the weight of his power. But Richard now found that there were now enemies in the realm that would refuse to submit to him regardless of the consequences, and thus Richard would now continuously be on the defensive. It also became apparent that his attempts to appease his brother's Yorkist establishment had failed, 
and therefore he began to rely on and implement more and more his supporters from the North, which would over time begin to upset many in the South. Despite the opposition, Richard would end up crushing Buckingham's rebellion. Henry Tudor sailed to England with a fleet financed by Brittany, but it was not in time, and word of the rebellion being crushed reached him, thus forcing him to sail back to the continent along with other Yorkist rebels who had escaped. Buckingham was deserted by his men, captured and executed as a traitor, and Henry Tudor's mother, Margaret Beaufort, was attainted, but was treated very generously given the nature of her involvement in the rebellion. Richard could not afford to alienate Margaret's husband, Thomas Stanley, aka Lord Stanley, and so Richard did not execute or imprison her. Instead, he made Lord Stanley custodian of her lands. Henry Tudor had declared his intention to marry the eldest surviving child of Edward IV, Elizabeth of York, to add to his legitimacy and had went as far as attaining a dispensation. However, after defeating the rebellion, complete victory seemed apparent for Richard, and Queen Elizabeth Woodville, still in sanctuary with her daughters and ever a pragmatist, seemed to agree with this notion. She finally allowed her daughters, including Elizabeth of York, to exit sanctuary with the understanding that Richard would secure proper marriages for them. Richard was forced to swear public oaths on this, and the release of Elizabeth of York was a great victory in itself for Richard. Marrying Elizabeth of York off would potentially seriously hurt Henry Tudor's support. The parliament that had been cancelled in the wake of rebellion eventually took place in early January 1484, which saw the statute known as Titulus Regius ratified, which formally declared Richard's right to the throne. But in April 1484, devastating news reached Richard. His son and heir, Edward of Middleham, died suddenly, throwing the future of Richard's legacy into turmoil. Both he and his Queen Anne were devastated by this news, but by that time, Queen Anne was in ill health, and the chances of producing another child with her were very slim. Therefore, Richard considered an interesting option. It is believed that he wished to marry his niece Elizabeth of York himself, despite her illegitimacy and relation to him. Although one would expect Queen Elizabeth Woodville and Elizabeth of York to be against such an idea, especially if Richard had indeed been responsible for killing her brothers. It is believed that Elizabeth of York was a willing participant in the potential match, although she would later deny this. Queen Anne would die in 1485, and some believe that Richard had his wife poisoned, or at the very least, made life as difficult as possible for his sick queen in order to quicken her decline. In the end, the marriage to Elizabeth of York never took place, as Richard was threatened with losing support of his northern affinity if he did so. He publicly declared that he had no such intention, nor had he ever, and continued to search for husbands for the bastardized daughters of Edward IV. However, he would never get the chance to marry off Elizabeth of York, for soon Richard would face his greatest and final test, Henry Tudor. Gaining support on the idea that Richard had killed his nephews, poisoned his queen, and intended to incestuously marry his niece, Henry Tudor began to become more worrisome to Richard. Four times in the past, exiles on the continent had re-established themselves and thrown the English government into disarray. Thus, Richard was very motivated to try and convince Brittany to extradite Henry Tudor back to England. Although the Duke of Brittany, Francis II, intended to keep the exiled Tudor and Yorkists as bargaining chips and had assisted in their failed first invasion, it is believed that Richard was almost successful in securing the extradition of these exiles. The exiles were alerted to the fact that plans to see this happen were underway, and thus they fled over the border into France where they were welcomed by the French. The French were willing to support Henry due to Richard's aggressive stance towards France and fears that a revival of the Hundred Years' War might re-emerge. The French agreed to support Henry's invasion of England and provided both troops and naval support across the Channel. On August 7, 1485, Henry Tudor landed in Wales at Milford Haven with a force comprised mostly of French and Scottish soldiers. Wales was chosen as a landing place due to Henry's own Welsh lineage, to which it was believed that some of his family members still carried a degree of loyalty in the area. 
Both Richard and Henry, fearing that each other's forces would swell as time went on, chose to seek each other out and engage as soon as possible. Richard's forces are believed to have been larger, and upon learning that Henry was seeking him out, Richard decided to stay put in the East Midlands, waiting for Henry, but eventually proceeded to Leicester with his forces, wearing his crown. On the night of August 21st, Richard camped near the town of Market Bosworth, by then knowing that Tudor's forces were close by. It has been said that Richard was tormented by nightmares this evening and was not able to attend mass before the battle. The next day, August 22nd, 1485, the Battle of Bosworth Field took place. It is said that Richard poorly managed his forces during the battle, and at one point, Richard's supporter and Henry Tudor's stepfather, Lord Stanley, betrayed Richard and committed his forces to his stepson. This is not particularly surprising, as Lord Stanley had gained a reputation of withholding his forces until he was certain who would be victorious. Richard clearly had not trusted Lord Stanley and had actually taken his son as a hostage in order that he could count on Stanley's loyalty. It is believed that the last order that Richard gave after seeing Stanley's betrayal was that Stanley's son was to be executed, but this order was not to be followed. It is said that Richard sought out Henry in the thick of the battle, charging him with the central division in nearly being successful in killing Henry. But this was not to be. Richard, it was said, had plenty of opportunities to flee and to survive to fight another day. But Richard was no coward and refused to become a former king or contender to the throne. Thus, he stood bravely in battle and continued to fight on. Eventually, he was overwhelmed, and it is believed that a Welshman delivered the fatal blow that killed King Richard III of England on the battlefield that day. His body was stripped and carted to Leicester, where he was buried in the Greyfriars Church. Henry Tudor would go on to become King Henry VII of England, donning the Tudor dynasty in England. Richard would be the last Plantagenet and Yorkist king to rule England, and he would also be the last English king to die in battle. Richard's body was lost for centuries after the destruction of the Greyfriars Church in Leicester, but in 2012, efforts were made to locate his remains. Excavations in a car park where the Greyfriars Church once stood astoundingly revealed Richard's remains, which were eventually interred in a tomb at Leicester Cathedral. This tomb can still be seen to this day at Leicester Cathedral. The reign of Richard III is a difficult one to ponder. His reputation surely suffered from the stories that emerged under the Tudor regime, and there have been many in the current day that have rejected the idea that Richard was the twisted and evil man that he has been portrayed as throughout the centuries. There is no doubt that Richard did have qualities that would be beneficial or sought after in a king. He was decisive, capable, conciliatory at times, and ruthless at times. He was cunning, well-educated, a successful soldier, and a great baron of the kingdom. Unfortunately, his ruthlessness may have been the main factor that led to his downfall and may have been unacceptable even from medieval standards. The questions surrounding his nephews, the princes in the tower, what happened to them and who was responsible for their disappearance still exists to this day. Although many in the modern day support the rethinking of Richard's legacy and believe Richard to be innocent of the charges, there remain just as many who are convinced of Richard's guilt in the matter and fervently believe that the criticism laid at his feet is well-deserved and appropriate. Perhaps the most damning evidence against Richard as king lies in the very way that he was defeated. The fact that Henry Tudor, with such a weak claim, being backed by the French, the sworn enemy of English interests at the time, was able to gain support and take control, in itself shows that there was a level of at least distrust and perhaps more likely hatred towards Richard in his own time. Nevertheless, however one may view Richard, either as a regicidal, ruthless murderer and usurper, or as a rightful king, unfortunately defeated and unfairly remembered, his story is no doubt one of the most interesting to learn, and for that he will most likely remain at the forefront of discussion for years to come.